After battles won and battles lost, closer still. After pouring all and paying the cost, closer still. When the pain of it all gets too much to bear, this is my song. This is my prayer. Closer still. Closer still. So close, I can see the sweat on your brow as you pray for us in your pain somehow. So close, I can hear your labored breathing as you carried our cross and took our beating. So close, I can feel your heart exploding with love so fierce and arms wide. Seasons come and seasons go closer still. On the mountains high and valleys low, closer still. When I finish my race and I see your face, I'll sing it for the rest of my days, closer still. Closer still. When I finish my race and I see your face, I'll sing it for the rest of my days. Closer still. Closer still. Hi, my name is Paul, and I'm a pastor at the Joyful Church in New York, in Fresh Meadow, Queens. And I have the utmost privilege to speak to you on an important topic, and that's the topic of community. Especially in light of what's been going on, being in the midst of a global pandemic, and being in an overly stimulated digital age, I think it's extremely helpful to talk about community and our need for it. Uh, I just want to quickly define community. Simply put, a community is a group of people that are connected by common interests, goals, beliefs, and usually within the same vicinity of one another. Meaning they, they can't be too far apart or they can't create a physical community. You can be an internet community but not a physical one. So I'm talking about communities in a classical sense here. Some examples of these type of community groups would be sports teams, it'd be a club, a close-knit group of friends that would, be, that would comprise a clique and my favorite which is the church because I'm a pastor. So these are some examples of community groups you might be a part of and participate in. And I can't emphasize this enough, this, this one important point, that the communities that you are a part of and were a part of shaped the person that you are and will be. All these community groups that you've been a part of and are continue to be a part of and will be a part of shape the person that you are. One example is, uh, there's, there's a reason why I love Dominican food. 
If you didn't know, at the tender age of three, I was first introduced to Dominican food. And this is because my parents owned the dry cleaners. And they owned the dry cleaners within the Spanish ghetto within Brooklyn, New York, on Knickerbocker Avenue. And my parents were working out all the time, and my older sister, who was around seven or eight then, she would watch over me. Right next to our dry cleaners was a Dominican bodega. While we were playing, she would randomly just bring me to the Spanish bodega, the Dominican bodega, and we would end up playing there. And the owner of the store, his name was Boo Boo, and she would, with such pomp and confidence, she would say, Boo Boo, I'm hungry. Meaning, won't you feed me? So Boo Boo, in a loving Spanish manner, he, he fed us. He fed us good Dominican food. Hence, developing this, this love for Dominican cuisine. You see, the community that you're a part of will shape who you are. And I'm not just talking about shaping your taste buds or your proclivity for certain foods. I'm talking about something deeper, something greater. It starts to shape you as a person, your soul, your perspective, how you see life, and even what you feel. You see, you, you don't think, see, and feel alone. You actually do it in community. Because each group has its own value system, non-negotiables, principles, things that they deem important. And you being in that environment and submitting to those set of rules starts to shape you. For example, I mentioned that you might have participated or be a part of a community group where we call a sports team. Let's say you start not attending any some of the practices, not attending some of the, the games or meets, what would you expect? You expect your teammates and your coaches to keep you accountable, to discipline you. Because within that environment, it, it's, it's seeking to shape you to be more disciplined, to persevere, to engender teamwork and a mental fortitude within you. And that's what a sports team and your participation in it starts to do. Maybe you're not familiar with being a part of a sports team. Let's take, for example, your small group of friends, which we call a click. A click. I know within uh, my close-knit group of friends, this is one core value, one core principle that we, we stand firm on. And this is the, the idea of family. So for instance, maybe we have uh, this get together that comes up, but something happens. We have a family uh, emergency and right off the bat, we know, oh, we can't make it. This idea of brotherhood has been entrenched in us. So not only do we have to make priority for our family, immediate families, but we see each other as family as well. And I, I remember um, this being confirmed in the midst of us, this unwritten rule, uh, when my dad passed away. Immediately after my dad passed away, uh, I remember my friends coming into the foray and supporting me and saying, what do you need? And just being there and being present. So because of my interaction and my experience with them, it solidified this idea of friendship and what a relationship should look like for me, for us. You see, the community groups that you're a part of and your experience with them shapes you invariably as a person shapes who you are and shapes who you will be. The question I ask, and this is my first action point, is this. I want you to discern which community groups you are part of. What are its core values? What are its principles and non-negotiables? And I want you to discern whether they are good or bad. You see, the community groups that you're part of not only shape you as an individual, but it has the power to shape society as well. And also depends on how deep these core values, these non-negotiables go. For instance, I'm gonna take, for example, Nazi Germany. We all know that the Nazis and what they did were, was bad. But there are two factions, two main groups that actually fought and tried to fight against the Nazi regime. And those two groups are the communists, the communists, 
and the Christian group. These two groups have core values of how they see the world, a perspective that goes deep with not only the individual, but how it should be applied all throughout life. And these are the two groups that fought. And this is very important to understand because especially within what has transpired in the year of 2020, we think about the different community groups that have been either aligning themselves or opposing what's been going on. And there's so many people and their opinions and news of what's going on that, that throws us into a loop. Everything is relative. How can we say, oh, this group is good or this group is bad? How do we discern? We need to stand by a certain truth. And as a pastor, there's three things I want us to consider as we discern the core values of the different groups that we are part of. First is, can the group that you're part of answer who you are? Why are you here? That's my second question. What are you supposed to do in life? And thirdly, where, are you, where, are you, where do you end up? And for me as a Christian, the Christian framework within this understanding of what it means to be a Christian is answered from the Bible. We know who we are. We're made in God's image. We're called to glorify Him and serve Him. Secondly, we're called to love those around us. Whether or not they're Christian, we're called to serve not only them, but this world. Because all of it is under God's regime. It's God's creation. And thirdly, we know that we're intended and intending and directed to spend eternity with the Lord. That's our direction. You see, our end goal is not in the immediate, in the transient. It's for eternal life. And that's why we can be faithful in the midst of where we are right now. So my first action point was to discern which community groups you are a part of. And from that, I want to ask, I want you to ask, how am I being affected by these community groups? How am I changing? And how can I better affect them? That's my first action point. My second action point is this, commit to that community group, commit. You see, Brett McCracken, he says in his book from, he says from one of his books that commitment matters more than compatibility. Commitment matters more than compatibility. You see, when the temptation is when we discern these different community groups that we're a part of, is that we realize, oh man, maybe I'm not getting enough from these community groups. And you start to outweigh how much you're giving and how much you're receiving. And I want you to refrain from doing that. We already live in a consumeristic kind of society and, it, and it's, easy, it's easy for us to be tempted in that way. But rather say, being tempted in that light and, and trying to ask what I'm getting from that group, I would rather have you stop and ask, how can I better serve the community group that I am part of? Especially if it's church. If you are part of a church, instead of asking, what more can I get from the church? Oh, I'm not digging the community. I'm not digging the worship service. I'm not digging the preaching. I'd rather have you ask, what more can I give? How, how much more can I serve? And this is your act of commitment, act of character building. Lastly, my third action point is this. Acknowledge and know that these community groups that you're a part of can never satisfy you or gratify you or fill that hole that you're looking for. Not even church. You see, the community groups that you're a part of will fail you. Sometimes this creates a residual effect in us and we see this today. I love what this actor writes. Uh, his name is Brian Cranston, and he, this is his response to the cancel culture that we live in. If, you, if you're not aware, the cancel culture is, is a culture where um, it's likened to a virtual mob. You're looking for any victim in the internet, in our society, and you're trying to bring him down because they didn't live up to your standard. So he writes this in response to the society that we are living in. He says that, I think our societies have become harder and less understanding, less tolerant, less forgiving, 
and in regards to that, less human. This is the society that we live in today. A society that is intolerant, a society that is unable to hold opposing views. And this is even witnessed not only in non-secular community groups, but also within the church. And I'm not asking for my church to compromise in its confession and its creeds, but I'm asking how can we be more loving? How can we, within these community groups, serve them and live from an ethic of love? Because you're gonna encounter a situation or a person where you just might not be able to handle them. You may think their views are so outlandish, it's so wrong. What do you do in the midst of that? We have to acknowledge that the groups that we're part of can never satisfy us, that there will be inconsistencies, that they will be incompatible at times. You see, with all these community groups and the environment they're trying to engender, the goals they're trying to engender, let's say, for instance, you're part of the Communist Party and you want equality for everyone. And you, we see in our society on a socioeconomic level, that's not happening. You might, as a person, start to become jaded and start to fizzle out in terms of wanting to pursue that goal. You see, what gives us strength as a person, as a community? Our ability, our wherewithal to continue in this fight in serving and loving others does not, does not come from wanting satisfaction from the community itself does not come from believing that this, this perfect community will come about from our participation with it or the building of it. You see, this power to persevere and to commit comes from the acknowledgement that we're broken, it's never gonna be prefer perfect, and it comes from the understanding that this community that we're looking for, especially within the church, is God-ordained and God-created. You see, as a human being, I know I'm broken. I see my inconsistencies. I see that I'm, I make a lot of mistakes. And the reason why I can show grace and love to other people and continue to be in community with them, especially where we're at a big impasse, is because we know and I confess that the reality of community has been created for us through Jesus Christ. You see, this is what I believe. This is what is deep within my perspective and framework and worldview as a church and as a Christian is this, that God, He was in perfect community with Himself. He had perfect fellowship within Himself. We believe in the triune God. And when He created us, we fell, we are broken. All of humanity is opposed to God as is written in the Bible. We're considered, we could, we're considered enemies towards God because of how we react. But God willingly sent His Son, brought us into the fold of His community. He, he would die on the cross. He would wash us of our sins. He would regenerate our hearts. He would give us new hearts, willing to love Him and serve Him. And, and this allows us to be in community with Him because we're deemed righteous, meaning we have a right standing before God. So apart from God, there is no perfect community. There is no ability to have true community. 